We're going to call the meeting to order, uh, Madam Clerk. Commissioner Tudor? Here. Vice Mayor Ro Ross? Here. Mayor Chudman? Here. And by phone, attending will be <laughs> Commissioner Johnson Sardella. Do you want to call? Uh, they're on phone. They're both on there? Yes, they're both on. Commissioner Johnson Sardella? Yes. And Commissioner Bill? Yeah, on the. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and, and stand for the pledge, please. Okay, we have a few housekeeping issues. I just wanted to take a minute to thank Senator Campbell for her generous donation of hundreds of turkeys and other food items to the village prior to Thanksgiving. Uh, I wish to thank her staff, volunteers, and her own Issa Thornell and our staff. It was a very nice event. I also want to take a moment to thank Miami-Dade League of Cities as they also donated turkey and fixings for our residents. Um, as a reminder, the day come rules are listed on the bottom of the agenda. Feel free to read them. As chair, it is my duty and obligation to conduct an orderly meeting. If anyone does not follow the rules of orderly decorum, they can be removed. So until such time, they can comport themselves appropriately. As a reminder, comments from the meeting attendees can only be made during public comments or prior to the reading of an ordinance when the chair opens public comments specific to that ordinance. Please quietly exit the log cabin if you need to talk on your cell phones or discuss a matter loudly enough to disturb others. Thank you for your cooperation. Is there any addition, uh, uh, deletions or withdrawals to the agenda? <coughs> I'm gonna make one recommendation uh, because it's so difficult to hear and because John is not here and two of our commissioners are not here, I'm making a motion that we table the uh, driveway ordinance till the uh, next meeting or possibly have a special, special meeting to do that. Is there a second to that motion? Okay, drive over and stays. This is Commissioner Johnson Sardella. Can, can you, is there a motion on the table? I couldn't hear it. Yeah, there's a motion on the table. Uh, I made a motion to uh, defer the driveway ordinance till the next meeting or to have a special meeting for that um, in order to, because um, Attorney Hearn is not here and because the two of you will have dip, might have a difficult time hearing as we're making discussions. So my, my suggestion was to go ahead and defer that to the next meeting or have a special meeting for that. Oh, in, in light of the fact that there's two commissioners on a call and this is a legislative piece, I, I will second that motion because I, I think we would want to knock this out in one meeting and, and I, I'm afraid because we have um, missing commissioners that we won't be effective tonight. Um, I also want to mention, because you cannot see, Attorney Hearn is not here, but Attorney um, Dunkiel is here in, it, in, in, in his stead. So that's a second. Um, all right. So uh, I guess the decision, uh, is, is there any objection to that? Or that's a motion on the floor. So I'll do, we'll just do a, a vote. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry. All those, um, any of those opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay. We're one. Um, we have a presentation. Is there any other addition, del uh, deletions, or withdrawals from the agenda? None? Okay, we're going to move to presentations 5A. Uh, we have with us FPL and, and, and the uh, manager, uh, Manners, if you go ahead and introduce them for us. This okay, tonight we have Mr. Alex Acosta from FPL joining us. And um, he met, or we met with a representative from FPL, um, Commissioner Bilt and I, and talked about doing street lights, um, LED street lights. And so they have a little presentation for us um, to give us some more information about. So. Great. Welcome. 
Great, thank you so much for having me. Can everyone hear me all right? Great, uh, my name's Alex Acosta. I don't know, do I need to give my address? It's uh, 8901 Southwest 76th Street, Miami, Florida, 33173. And uh, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening, especially go up first. And I gotta say that it's freezing in here, but although it's freezing in here, this is one of the warmest chambers I've ever been in. I, I really do appreciate the, the, uh, the environment and the atmosphere in here. So uh, we're really excited about our program, this street lighting tariff. This was just launched earlier on this year. Uh, it's to primarily replace our premium lighting program. It is going to allow cities and municipalities and towns to replace the FPL-owned street lights, high-pressure sodium street lights, with LED technologies without any out-of-pocket capital expenses. So that's wonderful in that we're able to adjust what your rates are to the new energy costs that are associated with the new lights and adjust the maintenance and um, the fixture costs uh, based upon the chosen technology that the city will have the opportunity to choose from. So just to give you a, a brief background, FPL, we're proud to say, started right here in Miami-Dade County some 80 years ago. And we started uh, FPL Group, which is now known as Next Era Energy. Uh, we're in 26 states, we're in Canada, and we are the largest renewable uh, wind and solar generators in our country. So we're really proud to, to make that statement. Most of our assets are in Texas and in uh, California. So um, FPL has uh, about some five million accounts in the state of Florida, so obviously we're um, we're awfully busy, and uh, when it comes to street lightings, we have about some 500,000 uh, units, of which we replace about 150,000 uh, of those street lights on an annual basis, whether it's due to natural disasters or car accidents or, or just uh, traditional maintenance. And we're, we're looking to improve upon that based on LED technology. You know, high-pressure sodium, for the most part, lasts some three to four years where LED technologies are going to last nine to, to ten years. And um, I believe we're, uh, we've moved on here a couple of slides. I can't see that all that well. Uh, next slide, please. Let's see. Leaders in light. Uh, next slide. I, I apologize. I, I don't have uh, that good of uh, vision. That, I, I have terrible vision. So the, the benefits of LED are clear. So on the left is LED uh, technology, and on the right is, uh, well, in this one, it's, it's opposite. So on the right-hand side, it's LED. On the left-hand side, it's high-pressure sodium. And what's wonderful about it is safety and security. That's the number one uh, benefit from it. I, I know our police officers here this evening will, will appreciate that. And uh, it has a high color rendering index. And what that means is that it's able to mimic light and copy light uh, much better. So you'll be able to tell the difference between red, uh, basically brown, and other colors much easier. Where with high pressure sodium, it's very challenging, where most of the, uh, of the lights look uh, fairly uh, red. So on the next slide, if we move on here. So how do street lights work? Uh, how do smart street lights work? Well, we applied to all of the new LEDs uh, smart nodes. And what these smart nodes do is they send back communication or data to our centers, which allow us to understand if the uh, street light's about to go out. So it just doesn't let us know that the light is out which improves our response time. It lets us know what is wrong with that light, whether it's the light, whether it's the conduit, whether it's the pole, whatever it may be, our first response is gonna improve significantly because our personnel is gonna be well equipped with what it is that they need to in order to address that street light that is out. Um, I see that it's, it's switching here on its own. So uh, we work with some of the top brands and, and our offerings for LED are gonna be with GE, Cree, Cooper, Halifane. Those are the real large 
uh, lighting manufacturers when it comes to LEDs. It's taken us some time to go through um, our R&D process. Uh, we've gone, we selected some 70 manufacturers of which, you know, we ran through some salt chambers uh, due to, you know, obviously our, our, our unique conditions here in South Florida. And uh, we narrowed that list down to about what we're seeing now, which is about five different main manufacturers of which we're going to have different uh, type of selections available to the city. So, you know, together we can obviously accomplish more. Uh, we're going to work closely with your personnel to help guide as to what the selections may be. Uh, we can't make the actual selections for you, but we'll be able to tell you what is comparable for the actual uh, existing high pressure sodium that you have in place in regards to what the wattages are and what our recommendation is. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly going to have a challenge in keeping up with the demand. Georgia Power did a similar program and they have uh, about a two year backlog. So we certainly want to move forward with the town as, as soon as possible. Um, I know that we have 185 uh, points here, so it won't be too challenging for us to do it. I can tell you that this program has uh, been approved for our entire footprint uh, throughout the state of Florida, but we're starting in Miami-Dade County and we're going to roll out the program uh, on north. So uh, it shouldn't be too much of a challenge to, uh, to work with uh, the town in that regard. So there's some examples of the fixtures that we're going to be seeing. The lower left unit is the RSW. It's, it's the one that we have primarily identified as a candidate for, uh, for the town. That's the one on the lower left. And we have, uh, I, I don't know if we want to pull up the, the sheet that shows the savings. I don't know if we were able to, uh, I sent that, that list over. But, yeah, it, you know, what is great is that this town is going to be able to retrofit the 185 high pressure sodium street lights with no out of pocket and pay less on a monthly basis as a result of the lowering of the energy consumption of those existing light fixtures. So. I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Since this was uh, Commissioner's Bill um, uh, sponsored this, this presentation and, and the item, the agenda item, I'd like to start with Commissioner Bill if he has any questions. Commissioner Bill? Yeah, I'm sorry, Chris. I heard his presentation. What was the question? I just wanted to know if you had any questions um, for, the, uh, for the presenter, for FPL, or any comments? Did you have any questions? I still didn't hear you, Tris. Do I have any questions? No. I, personally speaking, I think it's a great idea. There's no out-of-pocket expenses. We get a better quality of light. It's a much greener proposition. So I think it's all a win-win. Thank you. Um, since we're doing the, I'm sorry, it's, it's very tough to hear. Um, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Johnson Sardella? Um, I'm in agreement um, with it being no out-of-pocket cost. I, I think that the lighting needs to be updated, and if it's, if it's going to create better lighting for safety without being light pollution, then I'm, I'm in agreement with that. Those are two great points by the commissioners that they brought up. So the first one was green. So yes, we will be reducing our, our carbon footprint as a result of this retrofit. And the second is, is lighting pollution. The benefit of LED uh, is that it is a directional light. So majority of the light will stay on to the street and not on to the residences, which we see with high pressure sodium. So. Those are two good points. Is also the quality of less, less blue light, and is there also the quality of the emissions of the spectrum of the light also different? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so there's less overall light pollution. Okay. Um, I might as well be going this direction anyway. Commissioner Tudor? No, no questions. Vice Mayor? 
in some of the materials I've read that there is a contribution in, in aid of construction to be paid by customers. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? That's, it, it depends. So if you say, okay, uh, FPL, we'd like to change out the lights, but we'd also like to change out the pole because we're not happy with this concrete pole. We'd like to go to a decorative pole then there is some out, uh, upfront capital expense. But as the program is established, it is targeted to not have additional capital. But if you start adding bells and whistles, if you will, to it, then yes, there will be uh, upfront capital expense associated with the project. But as it stands and has it's presented to the town currently, there is no out-of-pocket capital required for this project. So is the next step to um, request a proposal, a plan for it? So the next step is to uh, basically uh, fill out the agreement. It's a tariff, so it, there is no competitive bid process to it. It's just to identify what uh, specific technology will be replacing the existing one, and then simply populate the agreement. It's a four or five page agreement. Um, which I can work with closely with administration to to uh, to populate that and then we uh, execute it at the manager's level or at the board level I'm not too certain of what this town's policy is um, I think that the decision should come after the Commission is has they had the opportunity to review the agreement and the details then I think it should come to the Commission to to decide Okay. Um, I believe that this is already this is also an agenda item that comes later in the agenda. So I think that's when we can discuss that. Unless we want to move it up in the agenda item right now, it's listed as being as part of the agenda. And I think we're, since we we're not discussing the driveway ordinance, I think we can do it then. Or you want to do it now? We didn't move I, it up. So while up while um, Alex is here and can answer any questions, we should. Yeah, I'd be glad to stick around. Sure. Okay. Yes, since th so for everybody in the sake of the audience and those uh, not physically present. Um, the presentation item is under New Business 12A, so we're going to ahead and move uh, the discussion up for 12A in front of the, um, uh, at the time of the presentation so that we can uh, address it now. Um, I'm fully in support of this. I know it was our legislative um, priorities uh, about a year ago to, to, we all sat down and discussed what the legislative priorities were and one of them was lighting. Um, so I think this is a, a great thing moving forward and appreciate uh, the commissioner um, built go ahead and bringing this forward and working to, to do this. Um, I, I see no negative side to us, especially if there's no cost. Um, I think this can be done in phases where we replace the lights that we have now. Once that lighting's in place and we see where the light gets distributed, if there's areas that need additional lighting, we can take that up as a different phase because that obviously would, would have incur cost because you're putting in new lighting, new poles, and things like that. But I think this is a great initial start, uh, and I think it's a way also to moving our, our community to be a more green um, environment as well, saving us some costs, hopefully some costs on the electric bill as well. Um, so is there a motion on the floor to go ahead and execute an agreement and, and do this? I'd like to see the agreement before we go ahead and execute. Okay, so if you don't like the terminology, would you care to make it an alternate motion? I don't know that we necessarily need a motion if we just give consensus to for the manager to go ahead and and take it to the next step and bring back what the proposal actually is in writing. I can follow up with FPNL and and get an agreement forward it to all of the commission and um, we can go from there. Okay, so we all and, and I would say that everybody's in support of it by the comments, so that's great. Okay, moving forward. Okay. Thank you so much, sir, and thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. Have a good evening. Uh, okay. If, if you'll please not speak out, that's one of the things that we asked in the beginning of the meeting. So let me be clear. Public columns is item 6A. We're almost there. We have the village manager's report first. Village manager. Okay. We'll start with the Hurricane Irma recovery. And so at this time, all the, the mulch debris at the Village Hall site's been removed. Um, the 114th Street site is, um, is underway. Um, we've had meetings with the consultant, H2O, uh, to work with the FEMA reimbursement, and those processes have begun. Um, they are, have been there every afternoon this week um, in the office at Village Hall. 
Um, a couple of things that I would like to get commission direction on is um, on the BCP body, the monitoring company. Um, we had had a, a cap on their expenses at 125. Um, we're seeing that, that we're going to exceed that. And so they're required by FEMA and are reimbursable. Um, so I would like to ask that be increased to, to 225. And so, um, and then, do you guys want to discuss, that? Yeah. ask questions? Um, I think that's probably a good starting point since that's a large sum of money. I'm so sorry. Um, So what I'd like to do is, just to be consistent, let's go ahead and have the commissioners that are on the telephone uh, respond first. We'll do it, Commissioner Bilt, then Commissioner Johnson Sardella, if they have any questions for that. So what you're saying is it's basically almost double, not quite double. Well, it is. And this, was, so this was an artificial cap that, that we put on it, because we wanted to make sure that, that if they reached X dollars, that it came back to commission for approval to, to increase that. OK. And so. Uh, Commissioner Bilt? Mr. Bell? Mr. Bell? Yes. Do you have any comments on, yeah, the, on the contract? I really just, I, I can hear bits and pieces. I, I'm not hearing everything. I know we were discussing about the contract with H20. Uh, originally it was 125, now it's 225. It's Peabody which is the monitoring company, BCP body, which is the monitoring company, not the consultant for the FEMA reimbursement. Commissioner, this is for BCP body. It's the monitoring company that we're required to have to get FEMA reimbursement. Right. And so um, from that perspective, we set the original cap at 125000 um, for them when we originally set the contract. Um, we see that right. the monitoring expenses are going to go beyond that. And so I do want to increase that, or we do need to increase that, because frankly, we, without the monitors, we get nothing back from FEMA. Right. If we, in fact, need the monitors to get reimbursed by FEMA, that's what we need to do. So I would, continue, I would suggest then raising the cap. Okay, uh, Commissioner Johnson Sardello. Yes. Um, obviously, it, 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 it appears as if this is a, a need and not a want, but my only question is I, as I understood what you said, uh, Manager um, Manners, was, it, it was an artificial cap, the initial cap that was set? Yes, it, it was based on, you know, is that correct? estimate. That's correct. It was based mm -hmm. on an early estimate um, of what. You know, we thought BCP body should be capped at that time. Um, as the as this process has lingered on, and we've had to vary the numbers of monitors available, um, the price has you know, or the cost has increased. Um, not the the oh, per okay. hour rate, but it's just the the amount of time they're putting in. And so now we're looking at it. And I, what I don't want to do is is overspend on this without commission approval. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. My concern would just be there's some sort of kind of monitoring of the point for where you're spending now and I'm hoping additional ones are needed here. I just want to make sure there's some sort of process, there's something that's in place, there's a monitoring of the um, the cost in a timely manner. So that if they're waiting agents or effectively that can I can I ask if this is I'm just going to ask is what you're saying you want to make sure that the monitoring of the monitoring company in other words the oversight of the bills are done in a timely way so they can be um, assured that we're aware of the cost increases as they come up is that what you're saying because I only got some of it I'm not sure my my concern is not being over budget. I understand it's reimbursed, but um, I, I just I don't want to see something that goes out of control. Okay. In well, case we we 
Everything's a mod. Um, but those are my only kind. Um, everything that the monitoring company does is matched to an invoice mm -hmm. from Grubs. So it, there's there's some checks and balances here to make sure that we're, you know, keeping track of everything. Okay. Just paying the monitors to hang out. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Commissioner Tudor? Um, I guess one question is how comfortable are we with this new cap? Um, um, I'm not sure that that will be the, the final cap. It just depends on, on how much longer that we need the monitors here. Uh, as soon as the debris is gone, then really the monitors are as well. Um, so the faster we get the debris out, you know, the, the better we are. Um, it's, it's really, it's a guesstimate at this point. And so I could, I could say it's a firm number, but I may be back next month saying, you know, hey, we need some more. Um, it just depends. Right now, we're, we are trying to get the rest of the debris out. And the monitors are here as long as we have grubs here removing debris. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need them. Once grubs is done with the debris, we don't need the monitors anymore. They have nothing to do with H2O other than providing the information that um, H2O requires for our FEMA reimbursement. Okay. So. And for clarification, if they're just mulching, they're not here. It's only when they're hauling and moving, correct? No, they're, they're here for mulching, here for mulching hauling, well. moving, everything. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we had some delay in removing the debris because we couldn't find the haulers to do it at the right price and, mm -hmm. and settling on where the tipping site was actually going to be because Pompano was too far away. Right. So uh, are the, did those delays add to the hours, the professional services from PCB Peabody? For the monitoring? Yeah. No. When, during those times when the Grubbs folks were not working, um, not hauling. I mean, if they were, if they were mulching, but not hauling, then we had someone on site for mulching. But um, like currently, they're they're not hauling right now, and so there's no monitors on site right now. They'll be back as soon as we, you know, get approval on hauling again. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The only comment I have is this is the necessary. This is not something that's optional, or we don't get reimbursed from firm. I just want FEMA. Is that correct? Yeah, this this okay. is this should be reimbursed from FEMA. Okay, so and so, so and without, right now, without it, we can't get reimbursed. Is my point. Right. So this and is not something that's optional for us. And if we can get all of this done by December nineteenth, which hopefully will be done faster than that, um, we are still at the eighty percent reimbursable um, from FEMA, um, which puts the village it'd be eighty percent from FEMA, ten percent from the state of Florida, which leaves the village a ten percent liability of this. Okay. So if we pay them 225 and we get reimbursed, then what we're really paying out of village coffers it would be just twenty five thousand dollars. So it's or an extra ten or twenty two five. So an extra twelve five, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Vice Mayor, uh, I had some trepidation over how the contract was acquired, how we entered into the contract, and all that. We've had that discussion with BC Peabody. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but we did approve the cap through a resolution. So okay. if it's going to be up, I think we need we need a new resolution. Okay. I will ask Andrew. We, would I, if it was done originally by resolution, yes. My recommendation is under new business, add an item, and I'll vote on a draft and adopt resolution. Uh, you could add it as uh, under, under section 12, new business. And when you get there, you can uh, do a draft and adopt resolution to raise the cap that was set by the commission. Um, if it's no objection by the, the other commissioners, since we already removed, since we already um, basically uh, finished our discussion on the uh, LED lighting, I believe, we can either put it before or after, it doesn't matter. W where would you like it to go? Mr. Dunkio, where would you like it to go? 12? It would need to be under new business. It doesn't matter. Well, tw it's, it's 12A was already called, so I guess it would be uh, 12E. Okay. 12E it is. Okay. Okay. Um, moving on, then we get to grubs and the actual hauling. Um, currently, we're trying to get grubs to remove the rest of the debris from 114th Street. Uh, we're having trouble getting the large 
semi tractor trailers that, that they have contracted into there. So they would like to use smaller trucks. Um, our contract with Grubbs calls for $3 a cubic yard for hauling. Um, they're saying it needs to go, because of the, the quantity of small trucks and having to pay additional drivers, they're saying it needs to go up to 950 a cubic yard. Um, I'm going to again look for a direction on the commission. We can hold grubs to their contract. Um, or we can, you know, if you guys would like, if you would like to raise it or negotiate that, we can do that as well. Um, one of my concerns is, is the timeliness of getting this out. I don't want to go to RFP and have to wait another month to get this degree removed, if at all possible. Um, we're looking at about 15,000 cubic yards of debris. Total, right? Total. Total. That's, and, but that's, that's an estimate from, from Grubbs. So that would be um, considerably more. FEMA is going to reimburse us. Is that, um, let me just, is that 15,000 for that piece or total? For that piece. Okay. So, um, for the 114th Street piece. Uh, FEMA would reimburse us our contracted price with Grubbs, the, you know, our, our percentage of the, the $3 per cubic yard. And so it would, this would be something that the village would have to absorb if there's an additional charge there. Uh, we could go to an RFP process um, that will take a little bit longer and would delay us. And I don't want to get out of that, again, that 80% reimbursement rate either. So for this. And there's a two and a half percent differential because it's not a five. It's just a two and a half percent. This all said, I mean, it's really, we, we can hold grubs, like I said, to the contract. Um, we've been doing that so far on the hauling from Village Hall, and they're, you know, having that hauled at $3 a cubic yard like was contractually agreed. Um, they're actually paying the drivers, I believe it's five a cubic yard. So Grubbs is, is taking a $2 a cubic yard hit um, on that because we're holding them to the contract. So. Okay. Um, I'll just, we'll do the questions again, starting with Commissioner Bill. I'm sorry. I yeah, I'm willing to vote for it. To raise the cap. <coughs> um, Commissioner Belt, I just want you to be aware that if you raise the cap, we are we are going to have to eat that expenditure. I just want to make sure you heard everything. Commissioner Bill. <coughs> I'm sorry. Was that? I can't understand. Was that Tracy speaking? I can't understand what they're saying. That was the mayor. She was saying that she just wanted to make sure you were clear that if we raise the cap that this will be a non-reimbursable village expense. You I was under the impression that... I think he's confused on the two. I think he's confused on... Because he can't... Five yeah. percent. I'm sorry? I was under the impression that every, all of our expenses, including uh, the, the people that are doing this, we get reimbursed 90 percent from the federal government and five percent from the state. We get there's different time frames at which we got the 90 percent reimbursed from FEMA. That time is past. We're on 80 right. percent right now, and that lasts through okay. November 19. But again, FEMA is lost. FEMA is only going to reimburse us for the contracted three dollars per cubic yard. Okay. Okay, now they want to try all the cubic yard. Okay. You wait. On expenses. Commissioner Johnson, Stella, you're breaking up. Commissioner Stella, you're, we're not able to hear you. Unfortunately, the reception is not very good, so you're breaking up. Um, I also wanted to notify everybody here that we're not going to be actually voting on this now. Um, we're going to be doing this, moving this to new business for the attorney. Okay, Christian? Yes. I can't hear anybody else. I can hear you. So it, it was $3 a cubic yard to pick it up, the mulch, and dispose of it. Am I correct? Right. And now they want $9 a cubic yard because they've got to move it from point A to point B? Well, they, they don't have to move it from point A to point B. They, they could do that. They could move it from the 114th Street site to the site by Village Hall right. to move it out. 
um, that comes with additional costs as well that wouldn't be reimbursable. And so that that option is is one option, but I think that would just you know delay things even more, quite frankly. So they want to now charge us $9? I'm sorry, I don't understand why. I, I think he doesn't understand the con and I didn't understand it either, so I'm going to do this for the audience, and then you'll have to repeat it for Commissioner Bill. The issue is if they take bigger trucks and they haul them, they can honor the $3 rate. When they have to have as m more trucks, which requires more manpower to move it in smaller trucks to the same distance, that's why the hourly rate is going up, correct? Yes. Okay. Do you want to explain that again somehow? Commissioner Bill, what they were doing was yeah. the, if, if they could haul it in the large trucks, you know, 100 yard one truck with one driver, then they could do it for the, the $3 that they contracted for. Because they can't, right. you cannot get the large trucks into the 14th Street, 14th Street side, they asked if they could use smaller trucks, but that comes at an additional cost because you'll need more trucks and more drivers. How much is the additional cost? Okay. The additional cost would be, it would be an additional $6.50 per cubic yard. That's a lot of money. That's a lot so of money. That just seems, yeah, to me, that just seems, have they actually tried to bring a truck in? Um, they have not actually I can, tried. I can, I, you know, I would say I can understand them not being able to bring the truck on to 114th Street. But can't they bring the truck onto 7th Avenue and load the trucks on 7th? It's making the turns onto 7th that will be running through residence yards. There's also tree limbs that will have to be cut to get the trucks in. Yeah. I guess other question: how many cubic yards do they think it is? What would our total expense be, our exposure? Um, our total exposure for that would probably be, let's see, 650. About 100000 700000 for using the smaller trucks versus the bigger trucks? About 100000 yeah. About 100000 It seems to me... It seems to me to be an awful lot. I'd like to see them try and bring a truck in and go for it there. Let's see what we can do. An extra, an extra hundred thousand dollars. We've increased the three dollars a cubic up to six dollars a cubic, and that to me that seems to be a lot. Okay. I also want to jump in on the solution issue. Mm -hmm. There ought to be a way that we can figure out to use what? our own median as the turning ratio, a radius. So that the only damage is coming not to the homeowners, but to our meetings, which we then repair. I'm sorry, Commissioner Johnson Sardello, you're recognized if we can hear you. Commissioner Sardello? Okay. Can, yes, can you hear me? You're still breaking up. No, I'm afraid we cannot. Can you hear me? No. Okay, I'm going to um, pause at this moment. Okay. Go ahead. Try can you hear me now? We can hear you then. My question was, is our, what is our current cap? I'm sorry, you're breaking up still. It's not working. Ask her to hang up and tell her I'll try and call a different number. Uh, uh, what is our current cap? For this purpose. Commissioner Sardella, um, could you hang up and the mayor will call you on her phone to try and see if we can hear you clearly? Okay, you asking Jenny to hang up or me to hang up? Um, Jenny. Yeah, just, you, just Jenny Harvey. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll hang up. Yeah. I'll hang up. Just to continue the meeting so we can have a flow, uh, Commissioner Tudor. Um, yeah, it's... The, it, the amount of money... Yeah, I guess, Christian? Commissioner, Commissioner Bill, um, Commissioner Tudor has been recognized. If you could wait, please. Commissioner Tudor speaking. Yeah, it's just hard for me to... Um, 
at this point really to agree to that type of uh, increase it is mm -hmm. you know when you look at it from three dollars to 950 um, but when you actually look at what it is in totality that is just you know that's a hundred thousand dollars that I don't believe that the village um, can afford to be paying out um, I mean, for me I would like to see what other alternatives that grubs can come up with look at the possibility of trying to get the larger trucks onto 7th Avenue so they can load up there okay. um, I, you know I, my, my gut tells me that there should be a way to do it to where as the mayor said that the only damage uh, would be to our own medians and not to uh, residents private property um, so yeah just at this point it's 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 just hard for me to to agree to that that 950 uh, cubic yard amount mm -hmm. okay. the the 113th street would have to be an entrance or an exit point and there's no way that one of those long trucks can make a turn there and not and only damage village property it's impossible it's just too narrow of a street um, I, and I, can't, I can't see it happening that I can't see it happening that way what happens after the 19th after the 19th our potential reimbursement reduces it drops from 80 percent down to 75 percent to 75 percent so, yes. so at 80 percent of the three dollars authorized we would be getting back about thirty six thousand um, dollars okay. if it's going to be 45 you know at the contract rate we would have been 45,000 we'd get back 36 at at nine and a half dollars we're talking about 142,000 it's it's considerable yeah. and that's that's why I'm I'm here and <laughs> but the longer that it takes the less we're going to get reimbursed so um, and plus we're inflicting harm to the people who live right there in that vicinity mm -hmm. I'd like to see it gone as soon as possible um, but we need to negotiate something in between three and 950 uh, agreed um, actually I just the chief just whispered in my ear that officer <coughs> Valiente um, may have a solution for how to get the the trucks in there so this is this is all new information to me as well so. uh, good evening Juan Carlos Valiente I'm a reserve officer uh, with Biscayne Park uh, it's a 40-foot trailer and you got about 22 feet with the rig but the rig is on an axis so if with the police department we can help him go basically uh, eastbound and the westbound westbound the eastbound lanes and have him make that white turn block traffic for him he can make that turn come around on 7th Avenue load and just go northbound on 7th Avenue to 125 and exit it's something that we could try as early as uh, tomorrow we could try it and maybe there is no expense you can use those 40 footers to haul it away could we Love do it. that without <laughs> destroying the property of the residents on those turns though? correct because if he's if he's going to go eastbound in the westbound lane he can actually pull up to the intersection turn the wheels the other way back up remember he's on an axis he can go the other way and go straight and the trailer will actually come around it, it won't it won't uh, I'll try it tomorrow with the with the gentleman with the white uh, Dodge Dooley uh, let's try it we can try it and that way there's no explain you can use the 40-foot trailers Um, Sounds for, the, good. for the added expense of a hundred thousand um, yeah. dollars we could we could replace an entire front yard that's true right? too. yeah yeah um, so for the commissioners that are not here and then trying to hear um, uh, reserve officers uh, Juan Carlos came up I'm sorry Valentes right um, came up and uh, offered a possible solution to get the larger trucks in at no cost to us and uh, and so far that has gained support on the dais. Yep. Okay. okay. Do you have any other comments? No. Uh, I don't have any other comments here. Uh, right there, Ross mentioned that, it, you know, if, if we do need, if what we're going to try out with the um, larger trucks getting in there doesn't, doesn't work, I do think we need to negotiate those 
um, down uh, lower than, than the $9 because I, I would say that they entered into the agreement. I don't know how much they looked at our roads, but we were presented with one, with one cost. And I don't want to waste more time, but I don't think that we should um, immediately acquiesce to their, their full number. That was my only um, additional comment. Um, I do have one comment for the attorney. Um, and I would appreciate if, and, and, I, and I mentioned this to you when we discussed this earlier, um, my concern is that we entered into a contract. I think we should look at that contract and hold them to that contract. I, when they did this, whether they did or did not look at where we were going to stage our debris, uh, to me this becomes, and I'm not arguing that this is, um, uh, just for everybody in the audience, the going rate for most people across the state, uh, especially in this area, is over $10 for hauling, and sometimes as high as 15 So right now haulers are at a premium or they have been, and, and the rates have been um, up, up discussed with Pam Bondi's office and, and what we are doing with the contracts and how to deal with that. So the rate we have at three is definitely great. The only problem then becomes when we can't honor that rate, okay, and then we can't get reimbursed for the part we can't honor. So, so my concern is that we have a contract. I'd, I'd like the attorney to weigh in on that contract. And then, and then at that point, um, we're, talking about it, we're talking about two main issues to me. One is inconveniencing the heck out of our residents who have been putting up with this for a long time. And that is a big deal. The second is there's a 2.5% difference, which isn't an enormous difference, but it is a difference that we'd have to eat that cost. So I, before I make any decisions, I need to see the numbers in front of me with what the actual cost is of the debris. I'm going to mute this. Hold on. The actual cost of the debris, okay? So I'm trying really hard here. Okay. The absolute cost of the debris, okay, and what that would be and what the difference of the numbers are. So until I had full numbers in front of me, and even if they're estimates, we should have some ballpark <coughs> figure to know what our exact exposure is. Well, in, in light of Officer Valiente's comments just a few minutes ago, I think we should probably move ahead tomorrow trying to, to get the semi in at the the agreed upon three dollars per cubic yard. If we can do that, then this is all resolved. Okay. So, you want to, any other comments? Okay. Anything else in the, in the report? Um, there's a few more things. The CAFR. We spoke with Deborah White of the Joint Legislative Auditing Committee this um, last week, and um, GMS provided us um, with a new updated timeline for completion of the 2016 CAFR um, as well as the 2017 CAFR. Uh, Ms. White um, has recommended that we move to an AFR format, which is instead of a comprehensive annual financial report, which is the CAFR, it's just an annual financial report. It's, it's a normal audit. Um, it's a little more expedient in that it takes less staff time. It really takes about the same amount of time from the auditor themselves. Uh, because the, the audit process is still complete. It's just the, the fluff that you put into the, the front and back of a, a CAFR that would be um, taken out of this and, and reduced. So that's my understanding. And so um, that's something that we may want to consider as well going forward. But again, I'm looking for commission direction on that. Um, and so. We can have comments, but would it be all right if we added that to um, um, 12F? and create that mm -hmm. down there. Okay. Okay. And then... Uh, I'm sorry. We can have comments. No, we have comments, absolutely. Okay. Um, I... We went to a CAFR in 2009, mm -hmm. if not the year before that. And that's the report that we've been producing ever since. It includes not just fluff, but it includes um, historical data to show the changes for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. All of that historical data is already compiled. It's just a matter of adding, tacking on the new year to it. So I, I think it's really important to present our financials with that broad perspective so we see where we're, what the trends are. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to lose that that detail in our financial reporting. Okay. Um, we also have not, uh, already engaged the auditor, contracted with the auditor, and contracted with our finance people 
and and in fact we're paying our finance people an extra twenty thousand dollars to help us produce a CAFR. So I, you know, I want to get what I pay for, and um, it's important to me to have that perspective. Okay. Um, I just have a couple questions. Um, but I'd like to make sure Commissioner Bilt, start with Commissioner Bilt. Commissioner Bilt, did you hear that? Do you have any questions on the CAFR or the AFR difference? Commissioner Bilt? Yes. Do you have any? Yeah, my contention is uh, I would go with the least or less expensive way of doing our uh, audit. If that's all the state requires, why would we do something more difficult? But I answer the right question. Um, I can, if I may address that. Um, when I spoke to the state about this, the recommendation was for the AFR because of the time consuming and the fact that we don't want to be in violation. They want the report sooner rather than later. They also, um, uh, this was Deborah White, also um, said that most small cities of our size don't do a full CAFR and do an AFR. When I asked for the difference and we went back and forth on it, um, the issue really at this point is the state is recommending that we go with an AFR for this, not for every, we don't have to, we can make that decision in the future. Mm -hmm. To me, it's about this one to get it done because we are a year behind. Um, the details in that are not, and let me be clear, there's no difference in the financial portion of that report. And that is my, what I've been told. Is that is your understanding as well? That's my understanding, but Commissioner Ross is right about the historical data and the statistics, the statistical portions um, in the back of the CAFR usually, yep. uh, as well as some, uh, some information, additional information that is usually put in the front, charts, so forth, that makes it more readable and more comprehensive. Christian, so. I, can't hear, I can't hear you breaking up. And it's going to be the same for me for the next 100 miles. Um, Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, I'm sorry then. Let me be off. Okay, I'm going to have to hang up. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. All right, Commissioner Bilt, um, unable to hear, and I'm not sure if Commissioner Johnson Sardella can hear as well. Commissioner Johnson Sardella, can you hear? You're here, yeah. Okay, okay so the question was posed whether or not, um, and we're not going to actually vote on this till later, we're just having any comments or questions on the difference between the CAFR and the AFR. Do you have any comments on that prior? We're not going to do it till new business. Okay. Um, this recommendation from the state is in, is in writing, uh, yes or no, uh, their recommendation that we change to this. It is in binding? Is it's in you? writing. Is oh, it's in writing? Is it in writing? Um, I, you know, honestly, I don't recall seeing it in writing. I think it came through conversation, but I can double check that and see if it's in the email. Okay, I don't so remember off the top of my head. We'll double check to see if it's in writing. Um, but okay. it, the recollection at this point is conversational and uh, uh, based upon other cities. And that was my, mine was conversational. Okay. It wasn't anything that was, okay. I asked for. It was something that, that was said to me when I had the one conversation. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. okay. And, and was, it, it, was it something that was, it was prompted from the state directly? The, the reason why I asked is that, that I hesitate when a regulator or something suggests that you do something, and I, I think we, if that's the case here, that it, it came from them, um, I would think um, strongly about going against their recommendation because if it is for this this particular time period to get caught up, because if we run into any other issues and we're not caught up and we didn't take their recommendation, I, I don't want us to be on the the wrong end of um, unfavorable treatment. Um, that is my understanding. In my conversation, was it was a recommendation, especially for this cycle, and after that, that would be up to us. That was that is my understanding from my conversation. Okay. Okay. Um, Commissioner Tudor, anything? I was actually going to make the same comment that uh, Commission Commissioner uh, Johnson Sardella just made. The fact that. If the state is making a recommendation, we should strongly, at least for this audit, uh, uh, look into taking the state's recommendation. Um, um, however, then we can address what do we do about if we had a contract where we're agreeing uh, it's part of the services that the CAFR is going to be conducted. You know, then we can discuss that later on. That you know, is there some kind of clawback on that aspect? Okay. Um, 
if, if it's acceptable for consensus for everybody to go ahead and move it to item 12F? Because we can't vote on it now. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, finally, open to public comments. Oh, Are we done with the manager's report? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were done. Um, no. I can just briefly run through a couple more quick things. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, finance, um, we're still working with GMS. They're doing a great job. They've helped us with the FRS, the FMIT, and the CITT audits. So we're getting caught up there. Um, they're in the process of rebuilding the 2016 financials in preparation for the, um, the 2016 audit. Um, in code, we've got our new part-time code officer, um, Christina Caserta. And I've got her working on the BSNA system and on the back end of code, getting it organized, getting it structured, so that code runs more efficiently, more smoothly. We can do more with, with less and in an organized fashion that will move forward much better than it has previously. And um, Parks and Rec, um, that is just moving ahead, preparing for Winterfest. Um, we have the Amazonia concert this coming weekend. And then the following Friday, the day before Winterfest, um, Senator Campbell has offered to do another food giveaway. Um, this time it will be farm fresh foods and so um, lots of vegetables and so forth. So we're excited about that. And that's the short version. Um, two quick things. Uh, Miami Veterinary Foundation um, with David Raymond, that was this free spay neuter program that we had talked about at the last commission meeting. Um, we've got that scheduled for the 8th through the 10th. That's, That's coming weekend. That's the trapping, the trapping, correct? It's, it's a trap, spay, neuter, and release. And so that'll be coming up this weekend. <coughs> and so, and then one last thing I need to, to bring up real quickly, and this will probably need a vote later on. Um, Parks and Parkways Board at their last meeting, they made a motion to present the concept of the development of the median area um, here on 114th Street, east of 7th Avenue. And um, what they wanted to create was a gathering area for the neighborhood. Um, the plantings for the area would include fruit trees, um, butterfly and native plants, and benches and pathways that could be provided. Um, I think it's a great, actually, use for that median. And I think it would be a very nice thing to, to do for those residents who've endured so much um, this hurricane season. So I'd, I'd love to, to talk about that when we have a chance as well. Um, do you want to put this on as 12G for this meeting? Or do you want to do it next meeting, or how would you like to do that? Um, we can do it either way. If this is, I know I've just added a bunch to it, so if you want to do it for next meeting, that's fine. Or if we can do we it We can put it on meeting. for 12G if there's no objection, and if we get to it, we get to it. If we don't, we'll, we'll put it on. Okay. Okay. That's good. All right. Um, what are we going to discuss? We don't have a presentation, do we? Uh, we don't have a presentation. Uh, actually, I'm just really looking for direction from the commission. If, if this is something that no one objects to, then we can work with um, the Parks and Parkway board and start to come up with a plan to present to the commission. Okay, so why don't we just leave it as 12G and we'll see how we go. Um, open for public comments. I have a question of the manager. And it's something that I would just like the rest of the commission to be aware of. I don't know if everybody is. But I learned on Friday that um, we, ha we sent to Tallahassee a local funding initiative request for, it says fiscal year 17, 18, but it really is for fiscal year 18, 19. Mm -hmm. The village sent to Tallahassee a request for funding to assist with a project of an anticipated cost of one and a quarter million dollars for uh, road upgrading roadways. Um, I wasn't aware that that was our request. And if we're all on the same page and going to be working towards the same goals, I think that everybody should be on aware of what the requests are going to be. Mm -hmm. And not only should be aware, but also should be taking part in the discussion and arriving at those priorities after a discussion among the commission. Last year, when we were talking about legislative priorities, we had at least two meetings at which we discussed what they were going to be. Different ideas were thrown out. And the commission 
as a board, decided that we were going to request um, somewhere around just under half a million dollars for road for road repairs. Mm -hmm. And it was based in large part on the stormwater study that was done. In the commission discussion, the majority of the commissioners wanted to take the word stormwater out, so we just called it road repair. Um, and of course, we didn't get an allocation from that. But my point is, apparently someone is calling the shots. Someone is making these decisions and putting together documents and not consulting with the rest of the commission to set these goals. And I want to understand how that's happening. Okay. Um, Dave Caserta, our lobbyist, called us on September 25th, I believe. It was about two weeks after the hurricane and said we need the legislative priority reports filled out immediately and sent to him. And the mayor came to me with that. And so she, with the suggestion that we use the same report that we had last year and probably just, and just up the amount that we were asking for. And so, and that's the way it I'll, happened. I'll be all happy to speak to that as well. These are the same, this is the same piece that we went in front of the legislature. As you know, when we did the log cabin, we resubmitted that over and over again because that's how you do it. You just don't go up the first year and get a, you don't just go up and get a funding. You have to go speak to people, talk to them. They have to be made aware of your priorities. Mm -hmm. um, this gets brought up several times and this happens over years. Mm -hmm. When this came up, I don't know if we were still in emergency. Were we still in the state of emergency? Do you recall? Um, I don't recall exactly. I, I, don't but recall it I think it was close. Probably, yeah. Not um, we, were was we were given, what, a one day, two day, three day turnaround? It was almost immediate when he yeah, wanted well, it. We met over a weekend to, to knock it out and get right. it to, to because it was an, we need it now and and so everybody understands in order to get things to the House and the Senate they have to have companion bills so it has to go from the House and to the Senate and so all we did was use the same priorities that was agreed upon and discussed by this commission those priorities were roads lighting nothing's changed nobody changed the priorities nobody uh, which was alluded to here <laughs> went behind closed doors and did anything. I don't know what you've told or did not tell the other commissioners since I don't, I don't have and a conversation with that. And, and honestly, that was in the middle of, of the hurricane, early hurricane recovery. I didn't tell anyone anything. I just kept going. And, and Commissioner Ross is absolutely right to take me to task on that. And so I own that. So and um, but there was nothing subsurface, or it was, it, it, there was nothing behind closed doors that's been applied here. What it is, is in order to get the, it in front of the Senate, it had to be done. It was used, the same one that was used from last year, and basically it was just updated. And the Senate forms are new. The cover forms that are used with the submission were new. Um, plus, we needed one, uh, a person in the Senate to do it. So um, uh, our, um, Dave Caserta went ahead and got a Senate companion bill with uh, Senator Campbell to go ahead and take that on as well. So now we didn't just have it in the House, we now have it in the House and the Senate. Correct? Mm -hmm. okay. We did go from a $460,000 request to a one and a quarter million dollar risk, a million two hundred and forty thousand dollar That request. includes some matching so funds from CIT too. That is, that is, someone made the decision, it wasn't this commission that made the decision. I'm not saying mm -hmm. nefariously behind closed doors, but mm -hmm. this is a public agency and all of our business has to be transpi transpired in the public. Mm -hmm. We can't just decide on Tuesday we're going to do something that we didn't talk about and didn't discuss in the open, especially having had that history of, I mean, not only is it required, but we are have been doing it properly in the past. Mm -hmm. This isn't the very first legislative session there is time to d have these things happen and the commission needs to make the decisions not one person not me alone not mr tudor alone the commission has to sit here and ma and hash it out in the public and make and give you direction because you don't have five bosses you have one bo boss which is this board right I, this is not the first time that something like this has happened and, and I just keep bumping up on this again and again and again, and I have to bring it out and set, and, and, and set a record. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the next thing is going to be. I mean, there's going to be another surprise down the way. I don't know. We oh. really do need to have an open discussion. Not only was, you mentioned the matching funds. Well, we had a budget process. We had a whole 
summer of going through the budget, we had budget workshops, and we set a CITT budget. The CITT budget does not allocate all of this money for this road work project that was just invented in, in September. Mm -hmm. do, so do, when we're going to spend public dollars, we have to put it in a budget. It has to be published. It has to be go before the public. We can't just decide on one day that we're going to do something different, you know, in midstream. To be clear, to be clear, this just so I'm clear on what we did, so I, I will own some of this as well. Mm -hmm. But when given three days to do a turnaround or have nothing at all, the decision had to be made. And I believe we were still in the state of emergency, you can check, but even if we weren't, the decision had to be made in like a weekend to get it to them or to have nothing at all. That's the decision. Now, when you ask for monies, it's an initial stage. There's no definitive on what we were going to spend it on. It was the same proposal used before. The only difference was we increased the ask from the state. We didn't increase the ask from the taxpayer. That was the only thing that was decided that was increased, I believe, because that was under the guidance when I spoke to uh, Mr. Concerter and also when I spoke to um, uh, some of the legislators, their recommendation was to ask for more, not to ask for less. We asked for a bit less last time. Other than that, nothing changed, just to be clear. Also, under the previous city manager, um, things were sent out as well um, with decisions made that weren't part of the budget process because of the time frame. I'm not saying that's an ideal thing to do. I don't think it is. No, I agree. I'm also not happy with that they didn't know about this because I don't like to be caught of court. I assume mm -hmm. that, that they were brought into the loop on this. Um, but that's how that happened, just so everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to open public comments. <coughs> George Marinoni, uh, 1002 Norris 118th Street. I just wanted to remind my neighbors that uh, the Amazonian Vocal Ensemble is having this concert, free concert this weekend at the Recreation Center on Sunday at 5 p.m. The flyers there, if you want to take a flyer with you, maybe invite some neighbors that never engage in the community. It's a good opportunity to bring people, you know, and because I know a lot of neighbors that live here and they, they are never coming to any meetings, any programs, or anything. So maybe we can invite somebody new and see some new faces sometimes. <laughs> so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Nicole Susie, 1030 Northeast 120th Street. My question is actually for the attorney. Um, I wanted to know how a resident of Biscayne Park would go about fundraising for events um, or for a specific cause for the village. So how a resident would be able to seek out dollars from other neighbors, businesses, um, and then be able to make a donation to the village, would it have to be done through the um, foundation's 501c3 and everything coupled with the foundation? Or would a private resident be able to go out and ask for monies from businesses on their own, not being a part of the Biscayne Park Foundation board? Or we'll, we'll, we'll answer the question. We're going to answer them after. So thank you. Oh, okay. So then my other question was, um, if it's not able for the resident to do that on behalf, not on behalf of the foundation, then as a resident, would the resident be able to create their own 501c3 and then go out and fundraise for a specific cause and then just make a donation to the village? And then when will these be answered? <laughs> After everybody's public comment? Yeah, we're going to go through and then we'll come back and answer. So okay. then can everybody take note and email me the answer? Because I have to get my baby to sleep. Okay. Thank we'll, you. We'll make sure you get the answer. Thank you so much, Nicole. Yay! Uh, good evening. Marie Smith, 12015 Griffin Boulevard. I am a member of the foundation, and I want to reiterate everybody to come to the, our event on Saturday at 5 o'clock. Uh, with regard to what the lady said, we have great difficulty in raising funds for the foundation, as you know, because we have a lot of projects in mind. 
And of course, we're working to try to instill in our residents to support the foundation based on the brick and the lighting and of course, um, popcorn machine recently. But besides that, I'm here because a couple of months ago I was here and I spoke about the condition of the median strip on Northeast 121 Street. We share that street with the city of North Miami. And of course, a disaster, although what had happened was construction companies redoing the homes on the street, parked in the median strip, did illegal turns, and ruined the median strip. But then there was another disaster when the Irma hurricane moved in, and I mean, it's a go down Northeast 121, and it's a disgrace. And, and this is what I have to say. Since North Miami is involved, and now they're building an apartment building on that street, and we're talking about um, a lot of more traffic, people making illegal U-turns on the median strip, that a negotiation be set up with North Miami to restore the median strip, and both of us share that median strip. That's my one concern. My second concern is I live in Griffin Boulevard. And if you enter the village based on the railroad station, there's a curve. So you kind of calm down your car. You don't accelerate. Then between the railroad tracks and the intersection opposite the church, there are at least 13, 12 or 13 signs to say, lower your speed, watch the medium, da 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 da. Now, when you go on my section, which is to make the left turn, to go down 115 right to 121 intersection, all we have on that street is one stop sign and possibly two, two signs. And now with the acceleration of traffic, based on Northeast 6th Avenue and Biscayne Boulevard, these cars are coming down our strip at a Daytona speed limit. So, and then we have an acceleration of, of residents and our dogs. We walk our dogs. And some of us walk two and three dogs at the same time. So you can imagine the danger there is when does somebody, those cars do not calm down. It's just zoom and especially during the business hours, the morning hours, going to the office, or getting to 95. So this should be a concern, that strip that we need more signs on, we need more police uh, presence there to, uh, to stop these speeders. And I hope that you know, no disaster occurs while this is being worked out. Thank you Thank very you. much. Could I make one correction? on the um, Amazonia Ensemble's concert. Ms. Smith said it's Saturday, but I want to make sure. Saturday, Sunday, 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 December 10th at 5 o'clock. Yes, 5 o'clock in the Sunday. Night, Dan Keyes. Um, just want to say, hold our debris contra contractor to the contract. There's got to be more ways to get that mulch into the truck than having exactly where they want, use a loader to run it around the corner, et cetera, et cetera. Glad we seem to be on that track. Uh, I, I, I would ask whether, you know, an AFR, and another subject, is a subset of a, a CAFR, and if it is, produce the AFR to meet the deadline and, and add on whatever you need to make it a CAFR. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, re-FP&L, re uh, glad to see we're moving towards new lights, glad to see it's going to cost us less than what we're paying now. Uh, reference new lights, I, I thought I heard the mayor say something about extra construction costs for new lights. Uh, my understanding is that if you have a pole, you, you want to put a light on it, it's the 25 bucks or whatever it is per light, it's not a $10,000 expense to put a new put the put the light in they put they install the light and they charge you uh, on a monthly basis uh, from now on and that includes the the capital costs of uh, that they incur 
uh, on a monthly basis. But that's uh, hope, hopefully that's the way it is. Uh, I'd hope we're already taking some surveys out there to see where there's just blank spaces. It's not going to be impacted by the changing of the lights. It's got to be some, I know there's some dark areas out there that, that probably need to be addressed. Um, you know, I 100 percent agree with with uh, Commissioner Ross reference the the process uh, that, that took place uh, on the state funding. I know it was a tough time, uh, but I don't know if we uh, uh, took a look at our our charter to see uh, what the process of calling an emergency meeting for purpose of uh, approving what was going to go to the state w was looked at. Um, you know, those are important things. She had everything she said was absolutely correct, absolutely correct. And and Mayor, I have to say, you might have thought that the manager was going to call. You should have asked them to call the rest of the commissioners to inform them what was the process that was going on. At the very least, inform them, and you would have found out that there might have been a, an objection from the from the rest of the commission. So, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Chuck Ross, 11166 Griffin Boulevard. It's an absolute violation of our process. I don't need to repeat what Dan just said. And it can't, I hope it's not ever repeated again. It's probably a charter violation, in fact, if the mayor was involved with it. You, what you had time to do was call an emergency meeting if you felt it was uh, appropriate to discuss this and it had it to be sent out within a certain time frame. You had time to call an emergency meeting. Further, you referred to the state of emergency. I understand that you uh, issued a proclamation. I never saw the proclamation until afterwards. It was dated September 5th before the storm. It would have expired on September 12th to answer your other question. It's good for seven days. So there was no state of emergency. It's still in effect here. Uh, I never saw it, so I don't know how there was in the first place. And you, saw, and you used that as an excuse to sign a contract with the monitoring company. That's another questionable thing that happened. The other thing that uh, I have a concern about is uh, for the previous two meetings, you tried to throw people out of the room and use the police. I don't think that you have the authority to do that. We don't have an ordinance for, or resolution for sergeant of arms, for uh, decorum, or for meeting rules, actually. Something that uh, actually our former, uh, excuse me, our attorney John Hearn tried to uh, get, uh, it wasn't him, it was one of our former commissioners I wanted to say that John was working with back in 2010. They tried to bring a decorum ordinance and a meeting ordinance and it didn't succeed and nobody wanted it. And though it's never been formalized. Something maybe should be formalized doesn't exist. So I don't believe you have the authority to do that right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Barbara Kuehl, 111th Street. I really came here today because I'm trying to support the uh, development of the median on 114th Street. Um, and then I heard about the signing, uh, going ahead with the um, asking for a million point two uh, for the road fund because we had a storm. And it sounds like now everything is going to be, well, this, we had a storm, you know, everything, just forget about everything else. We did have a storm. It knocked down a lot of trees, but I can't believe that Commissioner Ross is the only one that spoke out against this, that nobody else was offended, um, really disturbed that something like this went through without calling a special meeting. It's, this is like the old, it, with, I've been, as long as I've lived here, it's the same old story. It, we only had, we had to do this immediately. We had no choice. This is, it's ridiculous. And even if we had, if we had lost the contract, I would have rather lose the contract than do something that to me was dishonest. And to play dumb that, well, there was a storm, we couldn't take care of this, we couldn't call a special meeting, S that's what is an emerg if you read the charter that's what an emergency meeting is for an emergency so if you thought you had one and you had to meet as a body to make a decision that's what you should have done and somehow i think you would have gotten it the meeting called and it would have done been done the way it was supposed to and i this is why i don't come to meetings because honestly when i do hear what's going on it's disturbing thank you Dan Samaria, 1030 Northeast 121st Street. Um, I think this commission and this administration needs to hold FPNL more accountable. Um, when we agreed, well, 
previous commissions agreed to give them 30 years or 10 years. I had FPNL agree with me, and Barbara Watts was here, had to agree that um, they were going to come out and look at a pole that's right behind my house. When that pole blows, it takes out 10 houses. We just had recently, I think a week or so ago, a squirrel knocked down a wire, and it took out the pole. I mean, it took out the wire, and we had no power for over nine hours. I think this commission and this administration has to hold FPNL accountable. There's a lot of wood poles out there that are not in good shape. And I think that this FPNL should be telling the village on each of the poles, and I think they can do it. And they claim they can't, but they can. They can tell you which pole does to what houses. So we need to have a breakdown on it. On, on exactly what's going on because every time I lose my power 10 houses are going out and I think my neighbors are about ready to hang me uh, because I'm the one that's getting blamed for it uh, if a little squirrel knocks it over so we need to get FPNL to be more accountable thank you thank you McDonald Kennedy, 11705 Northeast 11th Place. I come in with a little list of things to discuss, and by the time we get through all of that, I have like notes front and back. I don't even know where to start. You're conducting a meter by meeting by speakerphone? Come on now. You just had a commissioner say, I'm hearing bits and pieces of things. That's ridiculous. Why are you doing that? Tracy, you want us to follow decorum. Follow the rules of the meeting. At one meeting, you allowed someone to get up and talk twice and then didn't want me to do the same thing. At another meeting, you tried to reduce the amount of time that people are allowed to speak from three minutes to two minutes. Somebody got upset, and you got mad because he was being undecorous, or whatever the word is for the, the adjective form of that word. You've got to follow the rules. Tonight, you tried to shove through this thing with FPL. Let's take it to a vote. It's a contract. Let's do it right now. I'm like, we all, we all talked about it. We're all in agreement. You weren't all in agreement, and none of us had a chance to even say anything about it. And you're trying to shove something through. So if something smells nefarious, maybe it is. If something smells incompetent, maybe it is. Uh, you two get your heads together and try to shove something through to the state? Come on. There's no way to run this place. And you wonder why people get upset. Now let me get to my agenda that I came here with. Pass Rox's ordinance in about 15 seconds, please, with the conversion therapy thing. That should be 5-0 in 15 seconds. It's a complete no-brainer. The lighting. Someone please ask the gentleman from FPL what the benefit is to FPL. I didn't hear what the benefit is to them. There's more to it than that. Um, the lighting is a big deal. Do not shove that through. You can ruin this whole place with bad lighting. The examples they show were parking lots and commercial streets. You put those ugly fixtures up there shooting blue light down onto our streets, and we go from village to strip mall like that. Watch what you're doing there. You need someone in here who's an unbiased expert to guide you through this process. You have to consider things like the direction of light, the temperature, Kelvin measurements, the intensity of the light, the color of the light. It's not that simple. It's not as simple as we'll put LED in and they'll shoot down on the street. You could ruin the whole place very easily. At the very least, have them do one at no cost. We all get to stand there and say, oh, it's lovely, or that's a horror show. No. You know, so do one. There's no harm in having them do one. Um, which brings up a topic that I think is worth you guys discussing at some point, and that is a light ordinance in this town. Because those blue lights, house by house by house, are changing the, the character of this whole village. You have houses with blue lights shooting straight out onto the street. It looks horrible. So the topic is, is worth, uh, is worth uh, talking about. And very quickly, I want to say something about code. It's fallen apart in this town. Someone has either made the conscious decision to not enforce codes or someone is incompetent in enforcing codes in this town, and that needs to change fast. That ruins everything really, really fast. So it comes down to you. Are you not willing to do it? Are you not able to do it? Or is someone telling you not to do it? I'd like an answer on that tonight, please. Thank you. Ernesto Oliva, uh, 10 Avenue, 
one seventeen zero nine. I do remember when you all uh, ran for commissioning, so and um, that you have major agendas like a fiscal responsibility and traffic was the second one. I don't know a lot about fiscal fiscal responsibility, but I understand about FPNL and you know that's. Can you go closer to the mic for me, please? Sure, sure. Um, just the first one about, for example, this one with FPNL that you are just willing to go ahead and spend, you know, go with the lowest light as Max said uh, uh, that has to do with uh, a commercial place, nothing that has to do with the character of the village. And then the second one is uh, about trafficking. I remember very clear and Harvey, I spoke with him today on the phone, so I wish he were here present, but you really run really strongly in order to bring back the values of uh, the village when it comes to speeding, and it's not happening. It's not happening. Yeah, I see police in cruising, but sharks cruising the ocean, they, they are not doing anything, just cruising, you know, chilling. I would love to see policing doing their job, and I'm not pointing at them, I'm pointing at you. I mean, the manager and the commissioning that really, I mean, we voted for you at some point just to take care of this, and it's not happening. Why? Why is it not happening? Why people are over speeding constantly on all these avenues? Why? Why? You know, I don't know. I'm tired of hearing the same thing, the same thing with code, the same old same. I have to be calling you guys, or we have to be calling you for you to do the job. For you, I mean, on 8th Avenue there is a pile of concrete there. The lady has been, you know, we have been complaining about that, and the pile of concrete is still there. Nothing happens. A washing machine in some place that we have to wash that washing machine. This is what we want. So it's all about this just beautiful log cabin, and that's it. I mean, village of Biscayne Park, we want this to look like a village, not like a, you know, Banana Republic place. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. Any other public comments? Good evening, Barbara Watts. Um, 720 Northeast 118th Street. I too have a page of all kinds of things written down. First, um, I want to say that I'd like, I very much hope that you'll support uh, the development of the median on 114th Street here. I think it's a great idea. Barbara Kuehl is really responsible for the idea. And I know many of my neighbors have asked, why can't we plant some fruit trees like they do in Seville or in Athens, um, a couple of lemon trees. And it would be a butterfly garden, as Barbara suggested, um, would be a wonderful meeting place. And I hear that um, there are some plans for decorating uh, new benches uh, in the works from uh, some other board, perhaps. And I think it all could go together to and get everyone excited about it um, and taking and, and contributing to it. And it could be the first test case of a way to develop medians, and we could do it um, in different. Um, parts of the city gradually as we go on. See how this one works. Um, and if it doesn't work, we can take the plants out, do something else. Um, the um, the village manager, um, and I'm glad to see uh, something going on with lighting. If we don't do what, you know, jump into something, that's fine. I think we should be very careful about how we choose to do the lighting, but it's good that the subject has been broached. The rec center has been poorly lit for years, and that's what was the on the to-do list for many commissions. It's just a matter of funding. Um, the... Um, Oh, golly. All right. The um, village manager clearly has his hands full, and his plate is like more than what you put on a plate when you're at a smorgasbord for free. All right. And so he's got lots of things to do, and he also has money concerns. And with, with, um, with this storm and, what's, and reimbursing things 
things that we didn't count on. So I think we do have to be very, very careful about how we spend our money and all. And I would wonder, I'd ask the commission to ask perhaps the village manager, how much time and the amount of money in lawyers' time and in staff time um, was spent or has been spent on the issues involving this, the self-appointed self um, homeowners um, association that um, seemed to take over the last meeting. I was listening to it and actually, I, 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 while listening, I, I cleaned my entire bedroom. That takes a long time. Time. Um, and it took over the took over the meeting. I think now about visionary visions. Okay, it's wonderful to have visions, but I think that it's going to this project has become redundant given that we will have our we're scheduled to do the same thing with our comprehensive plan in the coming year, and we residents elected you our commissioners to spearhead that project. Um, and this is your job, and I expect it of you, not of people who are not elected and self-appointed. Now, um, also the conversion therapy, I think it's something the cart before the horse. I think there's no need. We have no commercial um, business here in Biscayne Park. Everybody, I think, it would in this room, and most 99.9% .9 in Biscayne Park would agree with it's a no-brainer um, to be against conversion therapy. It's not gonna work. Um, but I don't think that we need to spend money on an ordinance doing this. El Portal and the other villages have commercial, so they can have psychologists or whatever, people that are, are do that as a business. I don't think we, we have that need here in the city. Okay, I think I'm um, out of time, so. Yeah, so yes, you are. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, okay. I'm out of time. Thank you so much. Are there any other public comments? None? Okay, we'll close public comments. Uh, Attorney, do you want to go ahead and um, would you mind answering the issue of the best appropriate way to um, raise funds and make sure the village gets those funds? My suggestion would be for that particular individual to be a volunteer for the Biscayne Park Foundation so that way they can solicit on behalf of the foundation. Okay. So it, they, there does not necessarily have to be a board member. It's just like any other 501c3 museums, whatever. They might have a group of people who go out and fundraise, but they have no voting, they have no say. They're just, they just assist in those functions. So that's something, uh, that, that's an option. As far as starting her own 501c3, she'd have to contract her own attorney and go through that route. But best way would be a volunteer for the lead. Thank you. Um, if I could, just uh, to clarify that, because you may not be aware of the bylaws of the foundation, there are... Uh, positions on the foundation that are non-voting positions, so it would be exactly what you're describing. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up for the other other commissioners. Um, I'll start with um, Commissioner Sadella. Are you able to hear? Commissioner Sadella, are you able to hear? No. Okay. Um, Commissioner Tudor, any comments on public comments? Um, just thinking about everything that was said during the public comments. Um, I know there were some people who spoke in favor of the, uh, the and we're going to talk about it later about the median on 114th Street, and I'm in full agreement with those residents. I think we should be looking into, uh, we should be looking into uh, um, beautifying that median. Uh, once it's cleared out, it's kind of a blank slate, so we should uh, look what we can do uh, in turn with that. Um, you know, I, one thing that I probably should speak on, because uh, somebody made a comment about how, you know, somehow uh, they were shocked that not all the commission were, uh, uh, you know, raising their voices about the issue, about the, the uh, proposal that went to the state. Um, I mean, that is something that I will be talking to the village manager about um, individually. Um, but that is something that, um, you know, appearance matters. And so that's something that we have to be cognizant of. And even though things are done with the best of intentions, we need to make sure that we're portraying an, an air of openness to the public. Um, I mean, I was a little surprised to hear about it um, because I hadn't been made aware of it till this commission meeting. Um, but uh, it is an item that um, I'll uh, be having a, uh, a lengthy discussion with the village manager on. 
Anything else? No. Commissioner Ross? I mean, Vice Mayor Ross. I don't, I don't have anything to respond to. Okay. Um, we'll move on. Um, consent agenda. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That was three. That was three. Yeah. Okay. We're going to head move to new business. We've already discussed 12A. Um, I do think we need to probably just address that perhaps um, regarding working with the manager, but I think we already did that, so we're okay on that one, correct? The manager's going to talk to FPL and come back with something for next meeting, correct? Okay, absolutely. Okay. So we're on discussion of floodplain, revision of floodplain ordinance, which is 12B. <coughs> manager Manners, that was yours. Okay, we were contacted by the state recently um, regarding updating our floodplain management ordinance, our floodplain ordinance. And um, apparently there are lots of changes required by the state um, for us to bring our ordinance up to speed and up to code for that. Um, they've been talking with our clerk, with Marlin, and she is a certified floodplain manager. So I will let her fill you in on, on what has been done and what we need to do to, to become compliant. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I went ahead and I was in contact with Leah Ch Chapman, and I also had a meeting with Mr. Billy Kil Kinley. Both of these are FEMA representatives, and what's happened is that um, in past years, ever so often, ordinances, um, floodplain ordinances need to be changed. Now, starting January 1st, the new Florida Building Code will take effect. When that Florida Building Code takes effect, it's going to request for uh, homes to be built one foot above freeboard, which means one foot above your normal uh, base flood elevation. Due to that requirement, that's what FEMA really wants to make sure that we have in our ordinance. Yes, it is due to the building code and it will be in there, but it, they also would like, it, like to see it in our, um, um, in our own ordinance. In addition to that, I've also spoken to her because I found that our ordinance seems to be a, a number of pages where other ones that I've been familiar with are, you know, half the pages we have. So she's also looking into cleaning up some of that and then submitting it to us. So um, if all goes well and she provides us with a decent copy, then most likely we can present it to you and that would be uh, the easiest way to, to go ahead and pass that ordinance. I have one question. Since we're looking at possibly doing a construction ordinance anyway, would it be tied into that? It would just take too long, probably, correct? Um, and this your has to be done quickly, right? construction ordinance is a separate issue. Okay. And actually, it doesn't, it really doesn't go with floodplain, okay. only because you're, you're going to have to follow the uh, South Florida Building Code. Okay. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Go ahead. <coughs> Go ahead, Commissioner. I, I don't have any comments. <coughs> okay. Is there a uh, date a date by which we need to amend our ordinance? They don't. They're not stating a specific date. Of course, you know. Um, they always like to see it, you know, the, uh, the fastest we can get it done. They would, they would appreciate that. But again, because I'm working with them, they always, you know, give you more time when you're making that effort to actually work with them rather than, you know, not getting in contact with them, not having that communication. So I, I don't see a problem with, I know that we're going to have to do it next year. Um, and I would say, I would say mid year is probably when it will, when it will be finalized by this commission. <clears throat> Thank you. So the, the last time we went through a change um, on our, in our code with regard to the floodplain was in 2012. And it was kind of an extensive process 
from my recollection, we had uh, someone sort of usher us through it. Um, we had used city planners, Bell and David, um, not suggesting that we use, well, certainly can't use Bell and David because they've gone off to do other things. But um, because we have limited staff and because we may not have staff with sufficient background in floodplain ordinances, I'm, I think that we should consider hiring a professional to usher us through that process. And, and I'll ask the attorney, I don't know, what other cities do when they are um, changing their floodplain? I mean, I, I can codes. tell you I drafted a floodplain ordinance once and we were guided by an engineer in the process and who was also our floodplain administrator for that and for the appellate process. When you're dealing with floodplains um, and with, with certain things that are also in the Florida Building Code, like I said, I, I've seen engineers used. Um, if, if that's an option, I'd suggest taking it. If, if, if it is, I don't, I don't know if, you, if the village has funds for that, but if it is. Um, the, the ordinance that we passed in 2012 appointed our building official as the floodplain manager. And so we made that, enacted that law, but then we never uh, dedicated resources to support that function as a floodplain manager. And subsequently, um, no one was partaking in the FEMA meetings and conferences that they have every once in a while. No one was putting in the reports that were required of floodplain managers. And we fell out of compliance with our own law. So what I would like to see happen is for us to do it the right way and to have that professional set up, set up a program for us so that we can uh, abide by the law that we pass, the ordinance that we enact on floodplains. And it's great for um, the, the village clerk to be in contact with the state. That's really important, having those communications. But I think that when we take the form ordinance, it's a form ordinance usually, it's like a template. I think that when we take that, we have to then consult with a, an engineer or professional that could um, make sure that it fits our needs. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Tudor? Yeah, no comment. Um, I, I don't disagree that having the technical expertise is definitely the way to go. If we can do that, I do think we have some tec technical expertise over here. Um, I think that's what you have done previously. Um, I think I'd like to really leave that with the manager to decide what we can and cannot do fiscally and, and come back with us as a more concrete specifically. If we have to update the plan and we have to get it done, there may be uh, another way to do that, which is other people are enacting um, floodplain plans and, and some of that could be used perhaps um, and with assistance of people who know what they're doing, we may be able to get away without having to have the expenditure to do that. Um, I do understand uh, Vice Mayor's uh, um, idea that we should have somebody on staff uh, to do that. Um, I know we may be looking at an ear anyway. Um, when we're looking at to, to do that anyway, we may be able to, to build that within that. I, I don't know with the expertise there. Since we have to get a planner, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that would be viable. If not, my, my thoughts are to see if we can do this or find out if there's a way we can reach out and do this in a way that's fiscally more, more revenue neutral as possible. I'm not trying to cut it down, but, but we do have a lot of expenditures coming up um, because of the hurricane and other things. And, and I just want to make sure before we, until our, we are fiscally on solid ground and know what our, what our actual monetary outlay is after the CAFRs are caught up. And at that point, I'd be willing to look at something long term. But right now, I'd, I'd really prefer to see if we could do it in-house as much as possible. Okay, currently um, my understanding is that FEMA and um, Marlon, please correct me if I'm wrong, FEMA is looking at our ordinance and updating it um, to give us a, a template at least. Um, if we need to you know, hire a consultant, it should be for a minimal expense just to really customize it to the village um, would be my understanding. Am I correct on that? You are. Um, FEMA does have a template on their FEMA site which you just download and, well, actually, they give it to you in Word, and it's very simple. It just says, you know, input the city, input this information, input that information. I mean, it's, it's very simple, but uh, Leah has taken it one step further. She's actually been looking at what we have, 
And what I asked her for, actually when I talked to her, I said, is it better to just take out this ordinance altogether and come in with the new template and just, you know, is it easier that way or is it best to stay with what we have? And she said to me, what she said to me was, well, I've already gone through it and made certain changes, but I'm happy to remove all the extra stuff that doesn't apply to you at all. And I said, okay, then go ahead and do that so that then we make it, you know, the shortest ordinance that we can that actually has all the information we need without having um, information that is unnecessary. So she's looking at that right now. I'm hoping that uh, once she gets that to me, I guess within the next week or so, I can forward it to all of you and you can look at it. That sounds good to me. Commissioner, Vice Mayor. Um, just two follow-up questions. We do have, um, or did have what at one time, Craig Smith is our consultant engineering firm. Mm -hmm. And that may be a resource to tap into. Um, the other thing is, I know we've been talking about our, our building official retired, and we've been talking about a request for uh, qualifications to hire a new building official. Do, do you have a target date when that's going to take place? Um, I'm hoping to get that out in the next two weeks. So. Okay. Because it ties into the floodplain manager, and that's mm -hmm. who we presently have. We may choose to do something different sure. going forward. And I also support moving forward with that as well, um, looking at, and I've talked to you about that okay. continuously, I think, for a couple of months. Okay. Um, do you need any further direction from us? On the I think line? that gives us enough to work with. Okay. Moving forward now. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Ross, 12C. This is the proposed ordinance for discussion of um, prohibiting the use of conversion therapy for minors. Yeah. So, um, it's a proposed ordinance that establishes a, civ uh, a civil offense in the village of Biscayne Park for people who subject minors to what is commonly referred to as conversion therapy. A number of professional health organizations condemn the practice of reparative or conversion therapy, indicating that it may be harmful to patients. Um, many Florida cities, large and small, as small as us and even smaller, have already enacted ordinances, including the neighboring cities of Bay Harbor Island, North Bay Village, and the village of El Portel. A sampling of the adopted ordinances throughout Florida was attached to the backup for the, uh, on the agenda. A similar bill was introduced in the current legislative session, but the bill received little support and was withdrawn from further consideration last month. Copies of the bill are also attached to the backup. We've seen that some issues, particularly those based on human rights and environmental concerns, require grassroots and legislative action locally until, the ground, until there is sufficient support for the state legislature or even the federals to act in order to promote the health, safety, and welfare of village residents, particularly those of minor children. An ordinance is proposed to make it a civil infraction to practice reparative or conversion therapy with a person younger than 18 years of age. In an effort to minimize the expense of it, I uh, have drafted the ordinance here. It is based on the things, the, the ordinances that have been enacted in other small cities, and I bring it for your consideration. I'm gonna start with uh, Commissioner Johnson Sardella. Can you hear? Try again. Okay. Do you want to address uh, 12, 12C? Yes. My, my concern, and, and I don't want these questions to reflect um, my opinion on this because I, I agree that we should be against it, uh, but for an ordinance that costs money, I'm trying to understand what the impact is for a community that has no commercial, um, and we already regulate our home-based occupation by our code. Um, also, this, this ordinance raises the question, after spending the money for an ordinance, how this would be regulated um, any different than, like I said, we have code on the, on the books that relate to the businesses that could be in our community with having no commercial. So I'm, I'm just trying to 
strictly balance the scales here as to the cost and really what's the impact on the community. Any further comment? If I could respond to that? That's it. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, if I could respond to, um, there was a resident who wrote to me about uh, and pointed out the business, uh, home business regulation that we have. And it's not strictly a regulation, it's a home business permit that, that the issue, pro the city provides. Um, I, my response to that is that there are already businesses existing in the village that offer um, therapies. That we have a couple of ALFs, we have other, we have mm, daycare centers, and we have, of course, a church and congregations. And these are sites that um, operate within the parameters of the existing law. They are entitled to do the business that they do, but they're also um, potential sites for exactly these kind of therapies. And I don't think we have to wait until something happens in order to try to protect afterwards. I think I'd rather see us be proactive and put something in our books and hopefully one day the state legislature will pick it up and, and it'll be, it, it will be beyond our um, control to enforce. The um, cost of an ordinance is an advertisement. I guess, well, certainly we could have our attorney review it. Um, I don't know exactly the dollar amount for advertising an ordinance, but I know that we have found less expensive ways to do it. And um, the enforcement issue, what is called for in this ordinance is for um, upon receiving report of a violation. In other words, we're not actively going out there and doing surveillance to investigate, but when a violation is reported, then the city would write a cease and desist letter and failing that, then the fine is imposed. So it's not going to be a, I don't believe it's going to be particularly onerous to have this in place. And it, and it says a lot to our residents that we're concerned and it's not an issue for a small group of people, it's an issue for everyone. Commissioner Tudor. Um. I guess one of the questions I have is um, uh, the enforcement aspect. Like, how would that, I guess, I want a little bit more information on how that would work. Um, and I guess this is more directed towards the village manager. If an allegation um, of conversion, that somebody is conducting conversion therapy, somebody calls in or anonymously tips off the village, who's responsible for con conducting the investigation? Are we talking about that based on an allegation, we'll just simply s send a cease and desist, but how do we follow up to make sure what type of investigation is, who's gonna be conducting the investigation to see that uh, that activity is actually being conducted before we start finding people? If, if um, page three out of four of the proposed ordinance, uh, subparagraph three, mm -hmm outlines upon receiving a report of a violation of this provision the village manager code officer or designee shall mail the licensed professional written notice to immediately cease and desist offering to provide or engaging in conversion therapy to me it just seems like there should be something more than just you know I mean, it's just what I'm used to. I guess it's more my, you know, you know, uh, my background is that I'm used to when an allegation comes in that the parties, and in this case, we're talking about uh, a civil a civil offense and the village uh, picking on that law enforcement capacity. So who's going to be, there's got to be some type of investigation that's going to be conducted. And is the village prepared? Do we have the resources to investigate and conduct um and do we have the people trained for it and i don't know that we do have people trained for it at this time um the reality is that it, we would send the cease and desist but i don't know how we would follow up beyond that to determine you know we send the cease and desist um if it continues and it's reported again 
we institute the fine is my mm -hmm. understanding. So there's not a lot of room in there for investigation beyond, you know, it being reported to us. So would that go then in front of the code board? According to the way it's currently structured? Yeah, the way it's it's currently structured, it looks like it would go to either either myself, the code officer, or, or a designee. Um, so from that perspective, I guess it would could wind up in front of the code board. So. I mean, there's when I look at this, you know, it's it's one of those things that's almost like a little internal conflict that I don't think there's anybody, and I'd be completely shocked if there's anybody on the commission or, or any, I mean, well, I shouldn't be surprised if there's any residents, but I would be surprised if there's any residents who were to say, hey, conversion therapy is a positive thing. I think everybody knows that this is, um, trying to think of a good term, quack science. I don't know what you want to say, but um, something needs to be done about it. But I don't know if an ordinance is, the way to go about it. I don't know if there's that part of me that feels like should we be doing, um, I'm just throwing this out, should we be doing a resolution where we're condemning the practice of conversion therapy and we're pressuring Tallahassee to, to address this? Because this is something really that unless you have a commercial component or unless you're the state that actually regulates mental health and regulates those type of industries, you know, I just don't, I, I mean, this is just more of, I think there's a better way for the village to stand up and, and, and condemn the practice as opposed to an ordinance. That's just my initial two cents. I'm, when I first got this, I, I must say, um, I know people have impacted. Uh, I do know um, children that have died. Uh, highest, highest suicide rate is among teens. So I looked at this very carefully and I read it a number of times. And my problems are very similar to what um, Commissioner Tudor said. To me, it's not the issue. It's what we're trying to get done. This is really a state and county level. At the same time, sometimes when you're in a position sitting here, you have to make decisions that are supporting uh, something to help move that along. Um, I also would support a resolution to that effect, but I cannot support an ordinance because not only just the cost, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of how do you support it. It, it involves the church. It involves uh, regulating in people's homes what's being done. And I understand personally the fervor of a parent who's decided that that's the right thing to do for their children, um, no matter what cost it is to that child. Um, it, the ordinance is actually proposes a problem that doesn't uh, currently exist in the village. I, I did speak to the, uh, the chief, and I did look into whether or not we had issues in the village. Um, we are a residential community, and once again, there is no commercial offices um, or doctor's offices. Um, it, for me, I would support a resolution to support the effort to try and get Tallahassee and, and even the county to do things. Um, I think that's how change is made, but I can't support an ordinance at this point. I'll just reiterate that we do have businesses existing in the village that offer physical therapies, social therapies, and they may very well offer this kind of a therapy. And they, they're here already. We don't need to be a commercial corridor for that, this kind of a practice to occur. And if it's occurring in my village, I feel like I have to do something about it. The, um, as I say, it, it's been proposed in the legislature in Tallahassee. It's been proposed at the county. It hasn't gotten much traction. But all of these neighboring cities, and something like 40 cities in Florida, have enacted an ordinance. And it just adds, I'd like to add our voice in support of that. And I'd be support, I would be in support of adding our voice to support it um, in the form of a resolution, is my, my point. Um, Commissioner Nancy Sedell, do you have any other further comments? Um, my only additional comment is the same, uh, that I would be in support of it in a resolution. But I think what we're trying to do here could be done in the resolution. Um, an ordinance doesn't seem to fit because of that commercial um, component. But I would certainly support 
um, this in a resolution to move this forward. So just to close the item out, I make a motion that um, the proposed ordinance be moved on for first reading. Is there a second? Motion dies. I'll make a motion, if I may, to adopt a resolution, uh, draft and adopt, that has language uh, similar to what's in here. Um, that, uh, that we oppose conversion therapy uh, as a, a negative impact on uh, young adults. Is there a second for that motion? Second. Okay. All those, we have a, yes, we can. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero carries. And, and who would like, uh, who would you like to direct the city clerk to send the copy of the resolution? Because we have to, the draft and, draft and adopt, so that way to get the word out, do you want her to send it to county, state, local? If you, if the commission has a direction for that, we could add that in the draft and adopt. Um, Commissioner, Ro uh, Vice Mayor Ross, um, do you have any thoughts on that? I, my thought was for an ordinance, so I don't. Um, my thoughts would be to go ahead and send it to the Florida League of Cities. Miami-Dade League of Cities and our state representatives and the governor's office. That's my thoughts. Is there a consensus on that or any else I've left out? Do we want to send it to the county commission? County commission as well. That sounds good. Vice Mayor, anybody else you can think of? Nope. Okay. Okay, the next we have is also uh, Vice Mayor Ross. It's a proposed resolution in support of Florida League of Cities 2018 legislative priorities. Vice Mayor? Yeah. So um, I have, for this is my third year serving in the Florida League of Cities Finance, Taxation, and Personnel legislative policy, policy committee. It's one of the five committees that the league has standing committees and they uh, try to shape policy for the state. Um, feed issues and information to the legislature to um, try to bring forth things that are beneficial to municipalities. Um, this coming year the Florida League's priorities include in brief defending the constitutional municipal home rule powers and opposing legislation that would intrude into municipal finances, stabilizing the CST, the community service tax revenue, to provide a broad and equitable tax base and to provide a uniform method of taxing communication services to benefit all stakeholders. Um, they're opposing the limitations on a city's ability to create a community redevelopment agency to carry out redevelopment of slum and blighted areas, something that the legislature has been trying to uh, close, close down. Um, they are supporting minimum certification standards for recovery residences and recovery residence administrators. Those are the sober homes that are um, establishing themselves in residential communities. <coughs> They are preserving local control of transportation planning and authorizing dedicated revenue for municipal transportation infrastructure and transit projects. And finally, they are supporting long-term recurring and adequate funding for water sources, water quality improvement projects, and necessary infrastructure to address current deficits and meet future demands, benefiting natural systems and all, for all stakeholders. So each one of those um, legislative Priorities um, in the agenda backup, there is the uh, issue brief that gives you some of the history of it. And for each one, I um, used the Florida League's template and tailored it to our village. And so I am asking for your support in approving the five, six resolutions that um, embody those priorities I just described. We could do them each individually, or we can do them all together. How, how would you prefer? Um, you have a I'm, I'm in support of all six of them, so. Okay. Commissioner johnson Sardella, do you want to go over them individually, or, or all six? 
Commissioner Sardella, can you hear? Yes, I can hear you now. Um, all is um, it's fine. I, I, I don't think um, I have a problem either way, whatever the majority. I have no problem with all of them at once. So I make a motion that we approve uh, the six resolutions in support of the Florida League's uh, legislative priorities of 2018. Is there I, a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 4 0. The 12E is, uh, was added as a draft and adopt or a proposal to draft and adopt the increase in expenditures for Peabody, which is a monitoring company, from 125 to, I believe it was 225 or 226. I'm trying to, do you have a amount? 225. 225. Um, we had a discussion on it. Um, so at this point, is there any further discussion on that item? Okay. Is there a... Um, no, is there a motion to go ahead and draft and adopt uh, the increase in the amount um, to uh, 225? And I just want to check with the attorney, that is the appropriate way to do this, correct? A, a motion for a draft, since it was originally done by resolution, this would be a draft. Re I'm sorry, resolution. Yes, right. yes, correct. Okay, so draft and adopt resolution to increase it from uh, 125 to 225. Is there a motion on the floor to do that? Is there a second of that motion? I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Commissioner Johnson Sardello, all those in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. All those opposed, none. Motion carries 4 0. 12 F. Um, this was the discussion on moving. Uh, there was some discussion on the AFR and the CAFR. Um, in deciding uh, at the recommendation of the state to move at least to this year to an AFR, which is a shortened version which would save on staff time and, and be more expedient in reporting it to the state, which were already um, past due. It was due on June 30th of 2017. Um, we anticipate, if I'm not, and you, do you want to talk a little bit about this, about the timeline and so forth, of uh, the new proposed timeline and what we proposed to the state, or what um, you proposed to the state? Yeah, I mean, it, it was it actually was proposed by GM, um, GMS the finance folks and I don't have that exact timeline with me and I apologize for that but essentially it's getting everything caught up it's the 2016 CAFR and the 2017 CAFR and being completely caught up on this um, by I believe it was May 2018 so that gives us you know really six months and to get both CAFRs done or both audits done Okay, so. and, and this is what um, was relayed to the state, correct? And, yes. and the okay. J, JLAC is going to be coming back and uh, letting some no decision. Do you have a timeline on that decision? I do not. I've, I've called them today to ask for that and have not heard back from them yet. So Di um, Deborah, Debbie White was in a project meeting today, and she was supposed to call me back, did not hear back from her. I'm trying to remember when we heard last year, I want to say February. But I, I'm not, I don't recall. Okay. Does anybody else recall when we heard back from the state on the extension? I think January, it was February? February. February. I believe it was February. They have like quarterly meetings. I think it was in February. Okay. All right. So hopefully we'll, can you find out for us and let us know? So I will. Yes. It's a bit nerve wracking. So here we go again. Take two. Uh -huh. um, um, Vice Mayor. Christian, can, could, you said that um, GMS gave us a timeline? They did. They, we, had a timeline that we had broken down um, and they sent it to Debbie White and so I can get that and share that Did with you, you guys. That with the, yeah, I'd be that, glad please. to. Yeah. Can you make sure all the commissioners this time everybody's mm -hmm. in the loop? Please, thank yes. you. Okay. I um, also have a question because um, when we were talking about this earlier, Mayor, you said when I spoke to the state about this, about the CAFR, and I I just want to understand if that's not the manager's job to be speaking to the state or the um, finance director's job to be speaking to the state about we, reporting finances to the state. Yeah, the, the letter came into the mayor and so she received it. 
Um, she spoke with the state. The finance director did as well as I did. And you were so out of town, I think, when I called. This was, yeah, this, one, yeah. I think you got the letter on the I got the email. Yeah, I got the yeah, 22nd of October or, is okay. when it came in via email, okay. is when I received it via email. That's when I forwarded it immediately to you and Beatrice and came in and spoke to you about it. Right. Um, she then responded to the state, I think, shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. um, waited to hear back. We did get a, a very short reply from the state that basically said received, I right. believe is what you shared with me. So, yeah. And then... Um, at that point, we, I know we were changing finance. We were we were changing finance managers. I think after that, subsequent to that, um, I did a follow up just to make sure that they weren't in need of anything because I knew they were going to meet. So I just made a quick phone call to the state, and that is when the recommendation was made. And you were out of town at the time. I think this was during this was um, during Thanksgiving. Right, and I think I told you I was going to follow up. You said that would be okay, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I've um, I just followed up to make sure that the state wasn't having an issue with us missing your deadline date because I know they had talked about a time well, frame. And Darren Mossing, our finance director with GMS, he was following up with the state as well that during Correct. That time, so. That's right. I wasn't yeah. right. Exactly. And so um, the state relayed the following information, which was the, and I think they related to you as well, and also to, she told me, I believe she told GM, GMS it, that, that to go ahead and she was recommending the AFR and to get with you when you got back in town on it. And mm -hmm. I did the same thing with you just to do that. And I, my suggestion was that you reached out to the other commissioners and talk to them mm -hmm. um, just to make sure we was in the loop. Uh, and that's basically it. I, I appreciate that explanation, but in light of all the other things we've talked about today, more and more it seems like one commissioner, the mayor, has more information than the rest of the commissioners do. And we've run, run into this problem before where there seems to be a lapse and it's not recognized that our chief executive is our manager and our manager is the person who is supposed to be speaking to other agencies about village businesses, particularly finance. Mm -hmm. So I just want you to be cognizant of that and be a little more sensitive to that so that we all operate on the same, on the same information when we're making decisions. Absolutely. There's information, I mean, there was a prior letter from, from uh, Tallahassee from the finance people, Miss White, or maybe even her superior, that came in and I didn't see it for three weeks. Okay. So I just, I please be cognizant of that and make sure that we're all on the same page. Absolutely. And I concur with that as well. Okay. Um, so on the discussion of the CAFR versus the AFR, is there any comments by Commissioner Tudor, Vice Mayor, or Commissioner Sardella regarding moving from the CAFR this year to the AFR to ex, uh, expedite at the recommendation of the state? This is Commissioner Johnson Sardella. I, I don't have anything more to add than my previous comments uh, regarding, you know, a, a regulator of the state giving a recommendation. So for this particular um, uh, cycle, I'm in agreement for us to just get it done and not have any further delays um, and then we can move back to the cap or have any other you know, discussion at a later time. Commissioner Tudor. Yeah, um, my comments are the same as before. I think that um, once a regulator makes a recommendation, um, it's in our best interest to follow that recommendation. Um, I do understand the value of uh, the CAFR and I mean, what I would be would like to see is getting the filing to the state to close that out um, and then you know, amending the AFR with the uh, with the uh, some more of the historical detailed information if that would be a possibility because we're paying I think for the the CAFR the part of the contract I think was with the auditors was to conduct a uh, the CAFR. Yeah. So, you know, I would say have them complete that part. I have a question about that because if it's only staff time to do that. Well, my understanding, and, and I talked with the auditor today about this, and I said, you know, okay, because I, I wasn't clear on what the difference was between a CAFR and an AFR. And so I said, you know, what, what would that save us on what we would be paying the auditors? What where the savings there as far as information go, or well, not savings, but 
what information is left out of an AFR that would be in a CAFR. And his explanation to me was that the audit portion of that, the financial aspect of it, um, would be the same as a CAFR as it would be in an AFR. Um, what's missing, CAFRs are more comprehensive in that there's usually an introductory section, there's charts and so forth in the, in the beginning that tells more of the history of the village and then there's statistics in the back that give for 10 years that show where we've been and, and how okay. we got to where we, where we are pretty much. So if and my question is if we submit a, an AFR and then there's information that might be pertinent to the village that, that you think the residents would benefit from for transparency, could we add that as a, as a section, whether it's to the to CAFR itself or just make sure that's available mm -hmm. at a subsequent time so that that information is not left out but would not necessarily have to do all of the history again? I just, I don't know what, it, what I don't know blindly is how much time we're talking with the staff time. Well, and honestly, I don't either. I've never done an AFR and so I don't know exactly. I'm just coming up to speed on this now. So I would need more information on that. So. So, absolutely. If you, uh, this is Paul Winklejohn from um, GMS and so. Uh, yes, again, my name is Paul Winklejohn, uh, the finance director representative through uh, governmental management services. Uh, a little bit of uh, color. Uh, the AFR co process was indeed recommended by the, uh, the state regulatory staff uh, for the prior year uh, audits that are outstanding, all of them, the 16 and the 17. So it's a rather extensive savings in time in terms of getting the report in. So that just, I'd like to punctuate that value to you. Uh, as far as a CAFR goes, I've done several of them uh, for municipalities in South Florida, and it's really a budget analyst analytical element that's fairly easy if your data is accurate. I can't speak to that, uh, and is it, is it attainable, retri retrievable? From a financial standpoint, it, it will be when the AFR is done. When the AFR is done, you'll be able to crunch all the 10-year the histories, et cetera, et cetera. That's fairly easy. It would not take long at all. Uh, to, to provide that for you if staff isn't already doing it. Uh, as far as the, the 2018 audit, uh, I don't believe it was discussed to not do a CAFR for that, but that, that's obviously your decision. Any questions I can answer? In your, in your professional recommendation, uh, would you go with an AFR under these circumstances for this, for this one? For yeah, 100%. You, get, get your, you, you can't build anything without the foundation. If you don't have financials that you can be confident in that are audited, there's no point in doing analytics. They'll be flawed. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No questions, but um, the, that comprehensive section of the financials is exactly what exp helps explain to the general public the things that the numbers don't explain. It, so yeah, I totally agree with you, and I, I live that way too. So the first thing I want to do is when we can put our finger on the financials from 16 and 17, and then as we're going through this year in 18, this spring, uh, that's how long it's going to take, uh, we can create instruments amongst ourselves that look just like the CAFR ones because it's the same concept. It's what you want to see to understand because most of us are not accountants. Most of us are, are business people perhaps and, and you want to see business instruments and that's really what the CAFR is. is it's a blend of, of analytical business instruments with uh, a, an accountant's report. Good stuff. Easy. Commissioner Tudor? No? Uh, no, no. Commissioner question. Johnson, Sudell, any questions for GMS? Thank you very much. Is there a motion to go ahead and move with the AFR for the, uh, as recommended by GMS? For the 16, it's 16, let me do it right, 16, 17. Yeah. Is, yes? I would, I would make a motion that we move forward with the AFR. Is there a second of that motion? I'll make the second. Okay, Commissioner, second. Oh, Johnson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. Very well. Motion carries. Okay, we're going to move now to um, discussion uh, briefly on the, uh, well, not briefly, uh, on the fruit, uh, moving the 200 and, oops, excuse me, for the median 114th to become more of a park. Um, if I may, can we ask, um, since we have representatives here from the boards, to come up and discuss a little bit of what they had in mind so that we have a better idea? Thank you. 
I'll, I'll just read the motion. You know, the motion was to present to the commission the concept of developing the median area uh, that we're talking about uh, as a gathering area for na the neighborhood. Uh, there would be benches and pathways, and that the planting material include uh, fruit trees, uh, butterfly attracting and sustaining uh, plant material, uh, as well as native plants. Uh, and we, it was thought that this median was fairly unique in its location uh, related to, to Village Hall. Uh, was kind of different than the others that are outlying in the, in the village. Um, there was uh, some people from the neighborhood that were interested in, in this. I think that's something that still needs to be explored, but uh, to ensure that uh, everybody's on board. Um, and I think we would propose to to somehow come up with a plan uh, to propose something specific to you through the through the manager, and um, work out funding and fundraising uh, for for that activity. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Any questions? Um, comments. Um, the only comment I had was, um, I think it's a great idea. I mean, like I said earlier, it's, you know, it's no one wants to have a hurricane and all the debris, but we kind of have a blank slate, so we have to do resodding. We have to do um, uh, reconstructive measures over there. So I would like to see it utilized in um, something more like a more pedestrian friendly, more like a park setting for residents, some, an another place for residents to potentially gather. Um, I'd also be interested if um, we may want to look into um, what are we going to do with the spot next to Village Hall. I don't know if we want to look at if there's anything that we want to do in that area since that's also is going to have to be rebuilt. Um. Um, I'd like to, I think we have a park and parks board. I, th I think that's a, a great question for them. Um, this is really something that they do, and, and I would su I fully support both of those projects being looked at by the board and coming back to us. I'm, I'm actually very excited about it. I thought it was a great idea. Um, as far as as far as the plan, I just like to see them move forward, and the commission give them direction and allowance to do that. But I also would like to see them also get support from the from the neighbors um, as well as if they can um, as much support as possible, so that it's it's a it's a buy-in piece as well. But I fully support it. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I just want to mention that I think part and parcel of the discussions we'll be having with the manager um, is is not to uh, restore area. Once we get a general outline of the the foot, footprint of the of the park area, that we not use funds to restore that area with sod if that sod is going to be taken up. So it might actually be some savings in not in not putting that forward uh, at this time. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So, is there a consensus to go ahead and do that? Yes? Yes. Yes. Do that. The consensus is to allow the board to come back to a proposal, work with the manager to come back for a proposal for both two areas. I didn't think they needed our consent. Well, usually we give them direction, and so they were coming to seek direction from the board and support from the board. I just want to make sure they're given that support. So all those in favor? Do we have I a motion? Yeah. We just gave consensus. Yeah. I thought we said we was consensus. Do you want a full motion? We can make a full motion. No, I don't think we need a motion. I don't I think we need a motion to have, a, have them guidance. work with the guidance. It's just providing direction, yeah. really, right. to me to work with the board to come back with right. a, a plan. So we don't need a motion. I just want no. to make sure we had consensus. Yeah. Yes. All those in favor for consensus? Support? Aye. Yes. Yes. OK. Um, a request for a placement of agendas on the next um, meeting. I'm going to put back on the um, construction ordinance. I delayed because we had too much on this one. I would also like to see the driveway ordinance. Um, I, well, let me let me ask. I know I want the driveway ordinance back on. Do we uh, do we want to have a special meeting or can we just wait on the driveway ordinance to the next meeting? I'm fine till the next meeting. Next meeting? Yeah, Maybe um, a little crazy with the holidays. With the holidays. Uh, I'm, I'm also fine with the next meeting. Next meeting. At this point, we are way beyond the extension that was granted on, um, 
on the on the ordinance that is already on our books. So I I mean we just keep tripping over each other and violating our own laws. We'll just keep going. Okay, so I think we have a consensus that we're gonna move that to the January agenda. Okay. Um do we wanna just I mean, I'd like to ask the village manager dealing with residents with driveways um, do you see any stumbling blocks or issues that you may encounter by us putting this off to january we have some residents that are waiting for direction on what they can and can't do and they're waiting to see a driveway ordinance put through um and you know they have been delayed considerably mm -hmm. um the reality is it is the holidays i don't know that you know we'll have the opportunity but i mean that's up to the, the commission to decide um, whether to do a special meeting or not so but i do know that you know some some residents are waiting for answers mm -hmm. so. i just wanted to mention something real quickly um just for you to know that remember any ordinance requires to also be advertised and all that wonderful stuff so it would take two additional meetings regardless just so you know regardless. once once the yeah, it would take two additional meetings once the ordinance is drafted and we have right. a first reading, but we're not even near that point. We're not even near that point. So, uh, I would concur that we have probably. I mean, the only other option, and and if if you want to do this, we can call a special meeting. We can. Uh, there's a couple options. One is to do without an attorney, so we can at least tell them what we want finished, um, and then draft a page that summarizes it and give it to the attorney. Um, we can have the attorney there since he's drafting it. As well, we'd have to check with the schedule to see his availability. Um, and I don't know what the schedule is. Um, basically, this would have to be done within the next two weeks. Yes. Do you have any thoughts? My thought was... Yeah, we have to get something on the books, but my thought was um, I could solve everybody's problem by just having a very simple uh, cut and dry ordinance that you can't park on, you have to park on an improved surface. I think it's just, it's the reason why we're, this thing is being dragged out extensively is that we're just over-regulating. That's my only comment on it. Um, I still, at this point, I'll leave it up to village managers to the reality of us being able to do this and have a special meeting and the cost of that. I just think it can wait till January at this point. It's been... Well, this and, and honestly, I follow the direction of the commission on this. If, if you as the commission collectively would like a meeting, then we'll make it happen. Um, the additional cost for that is, of course, you know, the... It's attorney time attorney either way, time but it's so attorney time either way. The, the truth yeah. is that it's attorney time either way. My concern is the holidays, really. All right realistically and you yeah we're going to spend the attorney we're going to spend the attorney fees whether it's at the right. january meeting or a special one so i mean what would what would you guys like what would you like would you like a special meeting well i, I know uh, commissioner ross did you have an idea of what uh, of a date that you may that I, okay. commissioner johnson sardella are you there yes i am do you have any comments on the do go ahead and do a special meeting I'm going to propose Tuesday the 19th. I'm not available. I'm not available. Week. Are you available? No. No. Are you available on the 11th? No. 13th? Uh, no. I'm checking with the clerk. I'm sorry. I have the next couple of weeks. It's really difficult for me to be honest. That's in the problem. And I don't want to do it three or four days before Christmas. 
Well, the difficulty getting too close to the holidays is that there's going to be individuals, residents who may want to come in. And they're not going to be here. Yeah. That's why I wanted to wait. It's, we're talking January. Yeah. It's, at this point, I don't think there's really a, okay. a discussion. I think it is. It would have to be in January. Okay. So I think we're, because of the tightness of the schedule, we're go leaning towards January at this point to the January meeting. <coughs> Commissioner Sardella. Okay. Yep. Okay. So no special meeting. January. All right. Is. Okay. January it is. Um, village attorney report. I'm sorry. Before I do that, uh, is there any other placement of agenda items for the next meeting? No. Okay. Village attorney's report. No report. No report. Um, announcements. Good evening, everyone. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is there any people from the boards that want to speak? No. Also, go ahead. Clerk. Good evening, everyone. Um, on Sunday, December 10th, will be our um, Amazonia Vocal Ensemble. They will be at the um, Ed Burke Recreation Center. Um, on Monday, December 11th, will be Cold Compliance Board meeting. Wednesday, December 13th, is Public Art Advisory Board. On Thursday, December 14th, will be Park and Parkways Advisory Meeting. On Saturday, December 16th, is our Winterfest. Monday, December 18th, will be the Planning and Zoning Board Meeting. On Monday, um, December 25th, and Monday, January 1st, the Village will be closed for Christmas and New Year's Day. On Tuesday, January 2nd, the Planning and Zoning Board um, meeting is taking place. Monday, January 8th, will be the Code Compliance Board meeting and will also be the Biscayne Park Foundation. And our next meeting will be on January 9th. We moved it from the 2nd to the 9th because of the holiday. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> I make a motion to adjourn. Second. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Adjourned. Meetings adjourned. Time adjourned.